this is a horse. Marguerite would disagree with me. This is a representation of a horse, which is sometimes an important distinction. This is also a representation of a horse. But this one is a little bit different than the one that you previously saw. This one, it has no hair. It has no color. It's no face or muscles. In fact, the, the thing that I think is most interesting about this horse is that if you were to take away anything else, it might not still be a horse. I originally wanted to talk about the, how the internals of Go worked. As you can see, that, uh, that's not quite the talk that I ended up with. I think most of you are familiar with this sentiment. It's pretty popular uh, in online discussions uh, about open source software. It's a reply to someone complaining about you know, a feature that's missing or a bug in a piece of software. And the, the reply is, well, why don't you fork the code? Why don't you do it yourself and submit a pull request? You know, you, the, source is, the source is there. And it's a troll. Why is it a troll? It's a troll because changing a piece of software, changing a large, complex piece of software, um, even if it's a really small change, is a really time-consuming process. Software, large software projects are notoriously difficult to understand. They're filled with thousands or millions of interacting components that are communicating with each other in interesting ways that have state that sometimes are even acting concurrently. They're some of the most complex things. The largest of them are, are arguably some of the most complex things that humans have built. So it's a troll because before you can change a piece of software, you have to understand the piece of software. And understanding a large piece of software can take days or weeks or months. That the time invested to understand the software dwarfs by far the amount of time to make the change. So what does it mean to understand a piece of software? When you understand a piece of software, it means you are building a mental model of how the software works. When you think about the programs that you work on, you don't think about the code. You think about an abstract mental model. That's what you manipulate. When you want to change that piece of software, you don't change the code. You change your mental model, and then you serialize it back out into code. I started reading a, a book about drawing. And it starts you uh, about drawing animals. And it starts you much in the way that this drawing looks with simple shapes and composing them together. But the thing that I thought was really interesting was that before it got to that part, it actually was explaining to you the skeletal structure and the musculature of the animal that you were trying to draw. And that seemed very odd. That seemed out of place for a drawing book until I realized that what it was actually trying to do was that it was trying to help me build a mental model of how the animal worked, of how it was structured. Because when you are able to understand that, you can draw a more faithful representation of the animal by manipulating the mental model that's in your head. We like to say that software should be written for humans first and for computers second. That we spend more time reading code than we do writing it. And that we should optimize for that. But the truth is that if we really believe that, we failed pretty spectacularly. Code is a really horrible serialization format for a mental model of software. We know this just by the fact that when we try to understand a very large, complex piece of software, it can take days or weeks or months. And, and why? Why is it that code is so bad at, at, encode, at, like, at being this serialization format for our mental models? And the answer is that production code, the real code that runs in the real world, it's filled with things that obscure the mental model, the simple structure. It's filled with error handling and timeouts. It's filled with workarounds for broken APIs and shims and compatibility with old file formats and old clients. It's a signal to noise problem, that you're looking for this signal, but it's obscured by all of this noise around it. 
you can't see this horse. That's what you're looking for. If that's not a good serialization format for it, what, what is? What do we do in software to try and get across what the software is actually trying to do? When I first started programming, I, uh, I wanted to understand better how production software worked, like how real code was written, where these Lovecraftian error messages were coming from. And so I cracked open the STL that was on my box. And uh, yeah, ask me how that went sometime. I mention this because we go fumped our source code, and so it has this unified serialization format, so that you, when you walk into a foreign code base, it's not that foreign. That the limited feature set of Go means that you don't run into a weird structure, a weird feature of the language when you read complex code. The limited feature set means that there are often only a few ways, or maybe even one, to do something. It means that code written by the most sophisticated Go programmers is eminently readable. You can read the standard library. You can read the standard library, it's pretty cool. But the problem is that it's, it's an iterative improvement. It still doesn't get you to this horse. It still doesn't lay bare the, the structure that you're looking for, although it is much easier. So what do we do when we're looking for this structure? What do we do to try to impart this to other programmers? Well, we have documentation. We have GoDoc, where you can look at a package's documentation. But the trouble is that GoDoc and documentation, it's very user focused, right? It's about how to use a package. It's not so much about how the package works internally. There are some programmers who write architecture documentation, who try to explain how the code works internally. The thing that I found, this is anecdotal of course, but the thing I found about it is that one, most of the time people don't write this kind of documentation, and two, when they do, it is inevitably out of date. That they wrote it at one point, but the software has changed. But I don't want you to think that this is just a problem walking into new and foreign code bases. That understanding the mental model of software is more difficult than that. It, it, has, it creates other problems. There is some software that, even given an infinite amount of time, it is so large and so complex that you, not a single person could fit it all into their head. And so we end up with this problem where programmers have to write software without understanding the entire system. And it leads to poor performance, or errors, or kernel panics. So I wanted to give a talk about how Go works internally, how a complex package like NetHttp or the runtime works, or how the compiler works. And the thought that occurred to me first was, it was kind of obvious, it was, uh, well, how does Go work internally? That seems like a prerequisite before I can explain it to anyone else. And the truth is that we don't have very good tooling to understand better how, how a complex software system fits together. We have, we work, we work in a very abstract space with poor visibility. And we have tools. We have tools like, uh, we have lots of tools for writing software, lots of tools to auto-complete things and jump to definitions, lots of tools for debugging and finding memory leaks. We have some tools for understanding, like the Oracle. There, there's code tracing that can walk you in and out of like functions. But the trouble is that most of that software is written for people who are already familiar with the code base. So I wanted to be a little bit more concrete. This is an example program. This is not a large software system. You don't need to read it. But it does fit on one slide. But even still, on one slide, it's difficult to understand what this program is doing. It's filled with code dealing with validation and error handling and special cases. And so I couldn't shake this feeling that I wanted a way to look, to find the structure of this software, but I wanted a way that a tool could assist me. 
I wanted a way to find the common case, the thing that was being exercised that was really that, that structure. And it occurred to me that I knew a tool like that that could mark the piece of, of software that was being run for a particular case. So that's the Go cover tool. Go cover tool, when you run it, for a particular set of test cases, spits out a cover report that tells you which particular lines were exercised by the test case. And so I came up with the idea. I came up with a prototype. I said, well, what if I took all of those lines and kept them, but I threw all the other ones away? So the idea was to write a test case that exercises the simple case of the software, run a coverage report, prune away all of the statements not marked, and then write the code back out. And so I did that, and this is what we get. And you can see that it's a lot simpler, that we can see, we can get a better idea of what it's doing, but there's still, it's still not quite there. There's still a lot of just kind of leftover garbage from the original implementation. So I figured, well, maybe we can reuse some of those cool optimization techniques that we've used in compilers. Maybe we can write some passes over the AST to try and simplify this code even further. And we can remove empty branches of flow control statements, remove unused variables and inline small functions. We can remove unused imports so it actually compiles. And then some other simplifications as well. And what you get back is this. And now you can see that this program actually, when it's removed of all of its, stripped of all of its incidental complexity, you can see that it's not. It's not really a complex program. That's a program that reads names from a file and prints them out, last name, comma, first. It's not, it's not all that difficult. But all of the incidental complexity made it seem like that. But this is a toy. This is a toy project. It's this thing that fits on one slide. So I wanted to run it against something more production. I wanted to run it against a piece of complex software that I didn't understand. So this is the dialcon function in NetHttp. There's a challenge to get it on one slide. It's the piece of code that makes a connection to a, a server, a remote server, you know, when you want to do HTTP or something. This is the simplest test case that I could find in, in NetHttp. It's very simple. It's a, kind of like a smoke end-to-end -end test. It sets up a test server. It runs a git request, and it reads out the body. So the idea was to run that tool with this test case only against NetHttp and see what that function came out to be. And this is what it looks like. And you can see that this is eminently readable, that we can see the structure of the software, that we can see that what's actually happening is we're creating a persistent connection structure, and we're dialing the remote endpoint and setting up buffered I.O. on it, and then we launch two Go routines to handle the reading and writing. And that's not all that hard. Just another example, this is the function that writes a request to uh, the wire, like a request object to actually serialize the request out. And again, it simplifies down to a thing that's completely understandable. We write out the status line, the headers, create something that understands how to write out the body and write that out as well, along with the body headers. So now you know how to draw a horse. You, you draw some basic, some, some simple shapes, some circles, and some lines to connect them, and then you draw the rest of the horse. Now I'm the one being the troll, right? Because the thing is, we talked earlier about how understanding the simple structure of the software is just one piece of the understanding. That the other piece, the second piece, is that you have to go back. Once you understand the simple structure, you have to go back and then you have to reread all of the code that was originally noise. Because the code, the code that you stripped away, the error handling and the special cases and the shims around broken APIs and that compatibility stuff, it isn't actually noise. It is actually important. But you need the simplified structure first before you can understand it. So I wanted to do that too. So what I did was, instead of just running it once, 
what if we add another test case? What if we add the test case that runs a head request in addition to get request and we run the same simplification process and then run a diff against just the git? And you see things. You see the code begin to complexify. You see things that you expect, like an implementation for the head function, sure. But you see things that maybe are more interesting, things that you might not have expected. Things like the fact that there's special handling for content length in the head case because, oh, that's right, like when you do a head request, the content length that's returned isn't the actual length of the body, it's the length of the body that would be returned if it were a git request. And since it's running more than one test case, now you actually see other interesting things like performance optimizations in that HTTP. So here, for example, we're pulling uh, an object out of a, a memory pool, but of course before we can reuse it again, since we're using it for the second time, we have to reinitialize it. I think that there are an immense amount of opportunities to build tools that help us better understand the software that we work with. And so my ask of you is to think about those tools, to think about how we could build those tools, think about the tools that you would want to better understand the software that you work with. And I hope that this little demo, this little prototype is a bit of a spark of inspiration, something that you can iterate on, think on, manipulate, uh, so that when you see this, you can simplify it down to this, and then with full understanding, get back to here.